So Ecclesiastes 3 opens reminding us, for everything there is a season. The part of the passage I want to focus on today is verse 7, a time to tear and a time to mend. I'm going to be pretty upfront with you and tell you that I don't always feel like a good Christian most of the time. I grew up in the church. I didn't really have some light bulb Jesus moment because I always just believed and accepted him as a young girl. Now, I've always had doubts that make me question God's goodness when I look at this world and experience hardship. And sometimes I find that maybe my political beliefs or something like that leave me feeling kind of on the outside. So a time to tear and a time to mend. Our family is almost at the one year mark of bringing home our adopted two year old son, Jalen, from South Korea. Something that was placed on our hearts to do long before we even knew if we could have biological children. My husband Josh and I also have an almost five year old bio son, Jackson, who has some special needs that make communication and emotional regulation very difficult for him. Both boys are my whole world, but I would be lying to you if I told you that I liked them every second of every <laughs> single day. <laughs> it's just the truth. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell to illustrate this is escaping with my husband one night for a quick dinner date and asking him if it would be okay if I just let out a scream in the car in frustration. He obliged, but then gently said, I think you should have waited until we pulled out of the garage because I'm afraid the sitter heard that. <laughs> I will never forget one of our first public experiences back in Bloomington Normal as a family of four. Uptown Circle and Normal, middle of summer, a lot of observers. We go to leave our house and Jalen burst into tears the moment we put him in his car seat. This was a battle from the moment we landed in America. Children in South Korea do not require car seats, and the confinement was terrifying for him. You know, so we get there, Josh and I each grab a child by the hand, but Jalen drops to the ground with the most fearful, blood-curdling scream. Josh, just wear him. I was doing one of those, like, whispering through clenched teeth things, <laughs> you know? And Jalen, he was worn in a baby carrier in South Korea all the time, so it's very cultural. The idea of standing next to us and holding a hand was just not even an idea in his mind. Every time we tried it, it resulted in an epic meltdown. For me, though, the worst part was that Jalen attached to Josh before he attached to me. I had heard of this happening, um, was prepared, but that's just something that can be really hard for your heart to accept as a mama bear. End of story, we ended up in the middle of the Uptown Circle with a smorgasbord of uneaten food from La Bamba, Josh, Jalen, and Baby Carrier covered in thrown rice and queso, and both children screaming because Jackson slipped and fell in the water. <laughs> People were staring, and I was kind of afraid it looked like these crazy white parents kidnapped an Asian child. <laughs> I mean, it's funny now. It is. I can laugh. But this was the season of the tear, absolutely just kind of tearing apart. You'd think maybe after that experience, sleep would help. Sleep was still not our friend. Adjusting from a 14-hour plane ride with a 14-hour time difference made me realize I am not as compassionate as I thought I was. <laughs> and it also exposed me to how much I selfishly crave comfort when Jalen was the one undergoing an even greater struggle. Switching off co-sleeping responsibilities with my husband for the th first three months was um, undergoing a level of exhaustion that I have never experienced before in my life. He was used to co-sleeping with his foster mom, so we kind of had to ease him into that. But what about poor Jalen, I kept asking myself. Restless sleep brought about confusion and night terrors, animalistic screaming, choking on his own sobs, and just complete disorientation about his location and who was caring for him. We didn't look or sound like the people he was used to seeing and hearing. Sometimes he'd reach up for us to be comforted, only to slap us away because we weren't his beloved foster ama or appa. 
You hear about these mountains that adoptive families have to climb to help a child in need. And while I do feel that's true, I imagine it only scratches the surface of Jalen's stories and his emotions. Now he's the real warrior, as he never had a choice in any of this. That's the real reason to me that the mountain is such a painful climb, not the paperwork and all the waiting, which is ridiculous, but adoption always starts with grief and loss and is often sometimes referred to as the primal wound as many adoptees will associate their adoption with abandonment from their birth parents. Children's brains can actually rewire themselves um, because they are so traumatized by certain experiences in early life, even something as simple as moving from one caregiver to another. Jalen went from birth mom to orphanage to foster family one to foster family two, and then to us, his forever family, all in under two years. One day it's likely he'll have some confusion with his racial identity. I know race is something that can be really hard to talk about, but we feel as a family it's absolutely necessary and to not resort to colorblindness, you know, the we're all the same mentality because it's just not comforting when a child's going through that. I want to kind of illustrate that with some words from a grown adoptee. He says, growing up, I didn't like to acknowledge I was adopted. I didn't want to acknowledge I was Asian. To me, when I looked in the mirror, I was white. My parents were white, my grandparents were white, my extended family was white, all my friends were white. I just wanted to blend in. But as I grew older, I began to realize this was a facade and I was hiding behind it to hide my inner pain. I was ashamed of being Asian. Growing up, I didn't have older Asian role models to look up to. I was picked on one time for being Asian, ironically in karate class. And at that point, I decided I wanted to have nothing to do with my Asian heritage from that point on. Now that I've started a family of my own, I've finally started to embrace my Asian heritage, especially as I see my beautiful children I want to be able to give them someone they can look up to and be able to share our common heritage together. That's from a 32-year-old male Korean adoptee. So you know how you can read up on something big that you're about to do? Prepare in every way you feel possible, research like crazy, but you just don't truly comprehend how it's gonna affect your heart until you experience yourself. That's how I felt witnessing the grief storm in both of my children. I was absolutely blindsided by Jackson's reaction as he could not express his frustration and would often scream for up to 30 minutes at a time. People would ask me how we were doing and I tried to be honest, but I also kind of began to see my words fall flat as I explained our situation. Very well-intentioned people would try to tell me Jalen had normal toddler behavior or maybe I just wasn't setting enough boundaries for Jackson. We were very cautious about having people over the first couple months because every new person was like an overwhelming threat to Jalen. He would have moments where you could just tell that he thought other people were going to take him. Once I did start inviting people over for visits, it was like many of them were kind of over the initial excitement of a new child and only a few continued to really want to be patient and share life with us. I felt isolated and began to question God's goodness in all of this, wondering sometimes if he even existed. In desperation though, I began to very just simply pray, God, if you're there, show me you're listening and please give me a sign. I just wanted understanding, not anyone to necessarily offer some giant solution or pour out sympathy on me, I just wanted people to get why we were taking things so slowly and why it was so hard. I wanted people to see my children as struggling to cope, not as misbehaved brats. I wanted to be seen as a mom that was doing all she could not to fail her family. It's possible I brought some of those thoughts on myself, you know, and I still want those same things. I want awareness and acceptance for adoptees, special needs kids, and their families. I feel like I'm slowly getting those things. Praise God, we are in a much better place. Um, not a perfect place by any means, but a better place, thanks to some therapy, 
supportive groups like this one. Um, we also joined the Autism Special Needs Care Group for Parents at Eastview, which I learned about through mom to mom and a lot of just taking one day at a time and celebrating the tiniest milestones, like Jalen having an awesome first swim lesson with Leslie this week. <laughs> my friend Joanna, who's in my care circle, she actually invited me to mom to mom. I didn't know if I would like it, but the childcare and the food were quite appealing. <laughs> I don't know if she remembers, but she was one of the first people to say the words to me, you are not alone. Do you know how powerful that was? You are not alone. Mom to Mom has been the start of my time to mend. After attending several times, we had a particular care circle meeting where I just kind of laid it all out there and what I've been feeling with my walk towards God. I was kind of simultaneously horrified at the same time, like what is coming out of my mouth? What are these people thinking? Because I was so feared of being labeled as a fake or bad Christian for being angry with God and questioning his character. But instead I was met with love, compassion, and people truly trying to understand my situation. More mending, I thought later that day. I felt convicted to get my family back to church, so we've actually been attending Calvary for the last few months, and I continue to see little nudges from God that this is good. Jalen loving the child care without tears, Jackson coming home and singing about the big God story. Now the boys, they fight like brothers, of course, but watching their relationship bloom is one of the greatest gifts of all. Sometimes they won't play with other kids on play dates because they're too focused on each other. But you guys, we can go on play dates now. <laughs> Small play dates in confined areas, but win-win. I'm not gonna tell you that the season of mending is easy or an overnight success. Some days I feel like I'm crushing it. Other days I'm carrying one of my kids out of jumping jacks surfboard style. <laughs> That's motherhood in general, it really is, and it's definitely been the journey with adoption and maybe the journey of my faith. I keep coming back to this notion that maybe God is using Jalen's adoption and even Jackson's special needs to show me what we all need as humans. Validation of the tears in our lives. We're not meant to walk alone. And then also, we must find the freedom to accept the mending even when it seems dramatically slow, or we might feel unworthy. I think we get it in our heads that our walk with God can't happen until we've got our crap together or have some <laughs> grand epiphany. And no, that's really not how it is. It can be slow and gradual, just like Jalen, learning to trust that we are his forever family. A lot of waiting, a lot of backstepping, a tiny step forward, but still progress. It's the same with God, and from what I know, he is ready and waiting to meet us where we're at. We just have to give ourselves the grace to try or even try again. Thank you. <laughs>